Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. I'm, I'm just doing a, a quick Instagram live here um, to let you know that we are starting um, a live conversation with Professor uh, Ole Moritzen. And um, he is one of the greatest inspirations I had uh, during my time doing research as chef in residence at Oxford University at the Cross Model Research Laboratory. And Professor Moritzen um, is, is one of the you know, leading voices uh, when it comes to understanding taste, to understanding what happens in our mouths um, and the textures and the different molecules and how those molecules interact with the membrane that uh, is our, our tongue, right? Um, and how those signals arrive to our, um, to our, to our minds in the form of perception. Um, and that is a key aspect of designing the healthier foods and the healthier processes for the future. Um, we can't really think about a transition, a green transition, right? A more sustainable uh, food world, let's say, uh, without taking into account pleasure. And pleasure is uh, what we try to understand with research, right? And in particular, the pleasure of, um, of taste. So here, we're not gonna be on, on Instagram live only. Here you can see we are on uh, live on YouTube. Um, Professor Moritzen is here and we're gonna start um, discussing just in a few, um, in a few minutes. Uh, well, now actually we're gonna start as soon as I close this Instagram live. So I just wanted to do a quick Insta live so you could see, um, know that it's actually not happening on Insta live, it's happening on YouTube. Uh, live. Um, so go check out the link in my bio or stories and go to um, to my YouTube channel and there we can uh, you can catch us there and eventually ask questions if you have any um, and learn from this uh, amazing human understanding uh, taste. Thank you so much. See you on YouTube. All right. Good. So here we are live on YouTube now. Um, thank you so much, uh, Ole, for joining us um, and, and dedicating a bit of time to help spread the word around um, the knowledge that we have available to us that we sometimes, um, in many cases, have no access to um, this knowledge. Um, and uh, in, in other cases, we should listen more closely on what are the insights and what are the solutions that this, that the science that in particular you have been, um, uh, you know, the research that you have been developing in the past uh, years um, to understanding how to create pleasure uh, and how to connect culinary and uh, I would say membrane physics or physics of taste um, in, in, in our mouths and our tongues in particular. Um, so I'm gonna start, um, Asking you a question, um, and it's so. What is in in your kind of perception how uh, we connect gustation and the knowledge of taste to sustainable diets and to sustainable eating or more sustainable eating? Well, thank you very much for having me. I've been looking forward to this conversation, and hello to everyone out there on on the internet all over the world. I'm happy to be here with all of you today and speak about and discuss with Charles uh, aspects of taste and how taste is sort of a guiding line in, in our life, both for um, living sustainably, but also living um, a pleasant life where the enjoyment of meals in particular with um, human, other human beings is so central to being a human being. And um, I feel strongly that in order to meet some of the great challenges we, we have at the moment with respect to providing for a more sustainable world, um, the senses have to come forward. And it's sort of pretty basic because as we all know, uh, we have to change the food systems globally and it has to be very soon. And uh, many of you know that there are reports out of people have been doing calculations as how to change the food systems such that we can produce healthy, nutritious and sustainable food to 10 billion people in 2050. And it's a tremendous task. And um, we are not going to, to meet the goals which uh, will involve eating more green, 
uh, meeting more vegetables. We're not going to meet those goals unless we focus on taste. Because I guess, as we all know, uh, even if someone tells us that something is nutritious and healthy and sustainable and low calorie and all these things that we are told, we, we know what to eat, but we're not doing it if we don't find pleasure in what we actually are eating. And this is why the basic senses are so important. And when we, saw, when we say taste, of course, it's really, um, it's all five senses we're using when we interact with, with the food. And I, I sort of like the saying that, uh, and I think that's why it's fundamental that, that food is the part of the world we eat. And um, the way we interact with the world is why the senses and taste here, taste proper, but also of course aroma, and the eyes, the ears, uh, the mouthfeel, uh, all that is important for, for appreciating food. So if we don't focus on taste, I think it will be difficult to save the world if you permit me to use that, that statement. So um, it basically boils down to if we, if we think of the green agenda, that is we're going to eat five, 600 grams of green uh, vegetables and fruit every day, which most people don't do. Uh, we eat far too much red meat, uh, too much uh, other kinds of meat, too much uh, starchy uh, vegetables. We have to change, change the diet and, and eating more green is, is a huge part of it. And honestly, uh, I'm, I prepare to be the first one to admit it here on, on YouTube. I think it's difficult. And, uh, and I think most people who are honest with themselves would realize that it is difficult on the average to eat five to 600 grams of green every day. And there's a basic reason for that. There are actually two. And one has to do with the biology of plants, and the other one has to do with us as human beings, what we are craved, what we're craving in terms of basic taste, something that has been shaped over evolutionary time scales. And I'm happy to elaborate that on that if you want me to do that. Yeah. So, well, actually, I'm going to um, quote the, 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 your book, uh, Umami, Unlocking the Secrets of the Fifth Taste. Um, that we just reviewed uh, for, our, for our book club with, with our patrons, um, there's one particular insight that I find fascinating. The first tastes that we receive as babies when we're born, our first food is sweet and is umami, right? Mother's milk. Yes. Um, and so that means that from an evolutionary perspective, we are predisposed to love, to feel comfort, to feel literally cared and... Um, uh, and, and of course, those two tastes, right, which are created by different molecules, and we have specific receptors for those molecules uh, that indicate the presence of energy, sweetness, and the presence of proteins through, uh, through umami, right? So, and you mentioned plants, and plants, um, especially greens, do not uh, have those two tastes. Sometimes they have a tiny bit of proteins and a tiny bit of energy, uh, but, but truly those, the energy is often stored in the roots, not necessarily in the green leaves, right? So this well, is they where- do, They do have proteins and uh -huh. carbohydrates and hence also energy. But the trouble from the point of view of taste is that it's sort of locked into these big molecules. For instance, mm -hmm. say starch, uh, we can't taste starch. We, our receptors can't identify a big molecule like starch, but starch is built of sugars. And once the sugars get loose of the starch, we can taste the sweetness. And the same thing with proteins. We cannot taste proteins. They just don't fit into the receptors on, you know, on our taste buds, but we can taste the individual components of proteins, typically uh, amino acids or the salt amino acids, and then also small fragments of proteins, something that is called peptides. And these peptides, and that's sort of a modern trend in, in, in taste science as well, that is they're related to this taste sensation we call kukumi, which is even more difficult to understand than umami. So plants do have the potential for being sweet and having umami taste, but it has to be released. And this is basically what cooking is about. And, and uh, so, so when, I say, when I say plants, uh, I should really uh, say uh, um, the, the green stuff, the, the leaves, the stems, the roots, and also the unripe fruits. But because when it comes to the ripe fruits, it's a different matter because the ripe fruits, they're supposed to be eaten. 
uh, because that's the way the plant can spread its uh, genetic material, its seeds or its, its spores. So um, they attract us by aroma compounds and we're used to um, relating these aroma, aromas to sweetness when we eventually taste the fruits. And also some fruits have actually plenty of umami and the tomato, I think is the most prominent example. We think of a tomato as a vegetable, but it's really, it's really a fruit. So, but when it cream, comes to the green stuff, it doesn't have the two basic tastes that we crave the most. And I think if we don't confront ourselves with that fact, we're not going to succeed in eating more green. But the good news is that we know how to help, uh, help this by imparting umami and sweetness as well to the plants, either by adding it from other compounds, and we can discuss that other types of food, or as I said before, we can transform this hidden potential of the plants to release these flavorful water, uh, flavorful taste molecules. And we basically do that most effectively by fermentation. And just think of a, a thing we, I guess we all love and, and use is um, from the Asian cuisine, soy sauce and miso. I mean, they come from soybeans and soybeans are not particularly tasty. Um, and, uh, but once they're fermented, they have just tons of, in this case, glutamate, which makes them very delicious and very, umami rich and there you go if you have your green plant and then marry it with some miso miso dressing or soy sauce then it's a quite different taste experience absolutely thank you um and so there's there's this idea right that we season food uh with and it's very common that we tend to think that oh seasoning food is all about salt um, and, uh, and, and something that lacks a bit of seasoning, we often just add salt to it. But the truth is that it's really this, the good culinary technique is about, as you said, unlocking, right? Through different temperatures, different types of uh, more or less water-based um, mediums, right? Sometimes dry, sometimes, um, you know, extracting um, with heat in water, but, so there's a whole kind of complex chemistry happening here um, to unlock this taste. But there's something um, very interesting that you mentioned on Sunday on the Patreon call um, that was that we tend to have, of course, salt on the table, which, you know, ideally we would not have uh, so much sodium in our diets. Um, and you mentioned the, the spice rack, everybody at home, or we tend to have like this, this spice rack where you know it's a lot of spices, but it's mostly aromas. It's mostly smells. Yeah. It's not tastes, uh, because cinnamon. If you close your nose and put some cinnamon in your tongue, there's not not, not much happening, right? That's it's going right. to dry your yeah. tongue. It's interesting. I mean, I like to invite everyone to take their favorite uh, herb, either dried or fresh herb, and 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 then taste it with the pinched nose. And you get very disappointed because usually well, you just have maybe a little bit of bitterness. And it's only when you unpinch the nose that you realize that the taste, which is really the aroma, is is in the is in the um, is in in the nose. And it, it's actually quite interesting when we certainly in the Western cuisine, many cuisines around the world, when you prepare a dish, in the end you do some tasting. And sometimes it's salt, sometimes it's acid with the vinegar or lemon. Um, but most often it's, it's spices that will do something which is not really proper taste. I mean, uh, um, a great example is, is chili, which uh, some chilies do have, have some taste, but really it's not, it's not really taste proper. It's a chemistatic action. It's something damage that is done to your mucosal membranes in, 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 on your tongue. And then you, you call the taste hot or, or strong, which is not a taste problem. But when, when um, so it's really aroma you have on the spice rack. And, but if you, for instance, try to learn from the Japanese cuisine, it's interesting because a lot of Japanese dishes, they, they start with the taste. That is, you make basically at bottom of, of a dish. And the most prominent way of doing that in the Japanese cuisine is that you make what is called a dashi. And dashi means basically aqueous extract. And the traditional way of, of, of making a dashi is you make an extract of a seaweed, 
or Kwandu, the brown seaweed. And then, um, and, and, and then you soak it in water and heat it a bit, the different recipes. And then you strain off the seaweed and then you add a fish product called katsubushi, which is a five times over conserved fish, which has a lot of powerful umami compounds. And for those who don't eat fish, and this is something the, this, the, the Buddhist monks found out maybe a thousand years ago, uh, you could use mushrooms, in particular shiitake mushrooms, instead of the fish. So the dashi is really a combination of something that seeps out of the seaweed and something that seeps out of either fish, these fish product, or shiitake. And now we know that from the seaweed, this, um, it's a, um, it's a uh, free amino acid, it's a glutamate, it's called, uh, and from, from either fish or shiitake, it's something called nucleotides. And we now know there's a wonderful mechanism. I think it's the most interesting thing in, in understanding taste. That is when you bring these two things together, the umami receptor really sort of sparks off and give you an, a very strong signal. And this is what you find in dashi. And this miraculous combination of these two ingredients, which sounds a little bit strange for those who are not familiar with the Japanese cuisine, but it's really the same principle that in other cuisines, uh, for instance, in the, in, in the British breakfast, you will have eggs and bacon. It's the same combination principle, or you have a sandwich with eggs and with, with ham, and, ham and cheese. And in Italian, umami synergy, it would be a sauce bolognese, where you have the tomatoes with glutamate and, and the meat with the inosinate. So these combinations, you could call it flavor pairing, which is very different from the flavor pairing theory that was proposed some years ago, which is really a flawed theory. This is based on a scientific principle. We know how it works on the umami receptor level and all food cultures use it to different extents. So it's a universal thing. It's not something we, we are trained to like. It's built into us because craving for umami. And that's why it's so powerful to use this, no matter which food culture you're, you're in, it's something uh, that you crave. Of course, there are always differences. Some people have more expressions of receptors and there, are some, there can be some genetic variations, obviously there are. But, but the general trait that we, create this umami and it's based on this principle. That's a universal, that's a universal statement. And uh, I, 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 I like uh, to think of that as something the sort of the more pow powerful thing you've got in your, in your toolbox or in, on your taste rack, that is to stimulate this principle. And uh, so, so uh, I would advocate that we should sort of think of having a, a taste rack, something that gives taste proper and obviously you could put dashi on this taste rag or you could put uh, konbu or you could put the uh, shiitake mushrooms, but a lot of other things that could provide for this. Uh, say in the British cuisine, you may have marmite uh, and that will certainly give you a lot of, uh, of, of umami. And of course there will be miso, there will be soy sauce. Uh, for those who are not strictly vegetarian, I would recommend you that you think of something like fish sauce Fish sauce is very rich in umami, and so is various kind of shellfish, um, fermented shellfish like shrimp paste used in various Asian cuisines. And all these sort of condiments or, or uh, taste providers, that's something that you can, just like the dry herbs, you could have on the shell, they last for a long time. Some may, you may want to put in the in the, in, in the refrigerator. But we identified, I, I've been doing this work with a, a close uh, a friend of mine who's a chef. We recently put out a book on how to eat green and we have a, a taste rack in that book uh, uh, where we enlist, uh, I think about 80 different uh, things you can add to your food to provide for more umami in addition to also some crispness, because that's an also very important to have something that is crunchy and crisp to sort of enhance the texture of, of, of vegetables. So umami and umami synergy is, is, um, is uh, very fundamental. I, I just wanted to uh, let you know a, a sort of crazy story. Just, just uh, a few days ago, we published a, a paper on the pairing of champagne and oysters. And that sounds a bit extravagant, which it may also be, but that's exactly the same principle that makes eight champagnes that has a lot of glutamate because of the double fermentation process in champagne. It 
interacts synergistically with the glutamate and the, you know, the, the nucleotides you, get, you have in oysters. And of course, the same thing would be true for other, for other um, shellfish. And you can also think of using other drinks and champagne. Um, and actually, sake is the one that is on the highest on the list. It has a lot of, of free amino acids and provides for a lot of, of glutamate. So this is a, a, a food pairing principle that is on universal. And I invite everyone who um, uh, have a favorite dish, uh, something they really like, and they think they're sort of really filling the mouth with giving with great satisfaction, the, the taste is lingering in the mouth. I wouldn't be surprised if you can identify ingredients that exactly provides this provides for this umami synergy. Yeah, and some of, some of the, the understanding of this actually also have implications for health and something like uh, if you want to talk about for, for, for stimulating appetite, which is very important for people, elderly people, people with dementia, people who have been in chemo chemotherapy and also sort of stimulate mastication and eventually also reaching um, a nice balance between food intake and satiety. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so much. So there's, um, there's this taste track idea, which I find wonderful, and this universality of the synergies, right? I'm thinking in Colombia, for instance, we have ajiaco soup, which is three different types of potatoes. There's some onion in there. Mm -hmm. There is um, and, and chicken bones, right? And right. chicken, right? So there we have the synergistic umami, which is really very much universal. The indigenous uh, communities in the Amazon have one preparation that is across several communities uh, that is called tukupi. And it's uh, a dark fermented paste, uh, very thick, cooked for a very long time on wood fire. So very smoky. And it's made of, um, of, uh, of chilies, right? And, and several ingredients, right? And we have like something that tastes of Marmite, but very spicy. And traditionally, there was no salt um, in, in the Amazon, right? So they would, they would season with this paste that is also then after, uh, after being cooked for a long time, preserved. And I'm, I'm, I'm not sure exactly, but it, there might be a fermentation process involved as well. Um, it's so interesting it when, you, when you mentioned salt, because there's, um, there's a phenomenon uh, with umami that is that if you have some saltiness in your food, you can enhance the perception of salt with actually less salt. It's something that has been known for almost a hundred years. So you can really cut down on the salt. You talk about the, the, the issue a little earlier about the, the increase of hypertension in people because we eat too much sodium chloride and one can actually cut it down by, by half if you can sort of turn on the umami bottom. And that has a similar thing with sweetness. You can enhance sweetness without adding, adding more sugar. So there's some aspects of also also healthy eating. I'm very happy you mentioned potatoes because uh, I, I come from Europe and most people are surprised to hear that during uh, about a, a one or two centuries, the European population uh, almost doubled. And most of that is actually due to the fact that we started eating potatoes. It's been extremely important for public, public nutrition. And nowadays in my country, people eat less and less potatoes. They don't think it's any particular interesting vegetable. They don't even think of it a vegetable. And some have heard that it's too much calories and you know too high glycemic index. But if you actually take potatoes and, and include the peel, it's actually quite a healthy vegetable. And if you study the cooking water of potatoes, in particular for old potatoes and potatoes with a peel on, it's actually very rich in glutamate. And in, in the food cultures, in the part of the world I come from, which is sort of Germanic inspired food cultures, you would never toss away the cooking water when you boil potatoes. You would always use it to make a gravy or steam vegetables. And, and this is, there's a, some old, um, almost forgotten knowledge here about the, the flavorful potato water. So I usually, sometimes present potato water, that's sort of basically potato dashi, half of the dashi. And you can then provide for the synergy, as you said, in your example, using chicken bones, uh, because then they would provide for the nucleotides. And um, 
my good friend, uh, Seth Klaus, he, he, he once said, well, let's, let's do something delicious out of waste. So he took the potato water as one part of the dashi, and then he used something that quite often is thrown away in restaurants, that is the, the heads of uh, shrimp, when you peel shrimp. And, but, but this is great, as you know, of course, for, for making um, and the shrimp comes from it, but, but if you cook, if you, if you, if you um, uh, dry the, the shrimp heads, you maybe even smoke them a little bit, then you get something like katsubushi and grind it into a powder, you add that to the potato water, and then you, you have a very good dashi. It's not mm -hmm. as clean as the Japanese dashi, but, but it's, it's, it's excellent for now bringing the umami to the vegetables, which is what yeah. we started talking about. Because, and you just need a little to actually help the vegetables become more delectable. Absolutely. And, and there's also something, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. So, uh, and and, and uh, there's always, uh, always the issue that comes up when um, one talks about what we call um umamification of vegetables, um, whether you should do it in a completely vegetarian or vegan way. My own uh, take on that is that we should use all the all the organisms we got on planet Earth in a, in a, in a sustainable and decent way. And I'm not speaking in favor of the, 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 the present state of agriculture and the way you do husbandry in, in um, for instance, in this country, pig farms and, and, and you have terrible situations for, 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 for the animals. But the animals will be with us, hopefully, also in the future. And I think we should take advantage of all the living organisms in, a, in an insightful and sustainable way. So I, I would claim that if we really want to uh, have a green transition, and we talk about not necessarily you and I and others that can, that can happily live in a vegetarian and vegan diet, but if we talk about the 10 billion people, in order really to move, I think we should borrow something from the animal kingdom in small amounts to spice up or taste up the, uh, the, uh, the vegetables. So I, I would speak in favor of using a little bit of fish sauce. You could even, even from a use from a fish species that we nowadays just fish in the oceans and grind up into a meal for other fish or for, 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 for pigs, uh, make a delicious fish sauce. You just need a drop in your dressing with the, with the, with the uh, with the vegetable and the same thing with with dairy i mean cheeses mature cheeses you just need a tiny bit of a mature cheese and then for instance parmesan cheese is, is a sort of a prominent example but all food cultures who work with dairy all always have cheeses that are um, fermented for a long time maybe also with some um, blue skin or white skin they're very rich in umami and just need a tiny bit to enhance yeah. the umami of the vegetables. So, and and I, I'm I'm quite I'm quite um, in favor. We should look carefully to the ocean because this is where we came. This is where we came from, and we need uh, food from the ocean, um, uh, the nutrients, in particular the, the the fatty acids, but also the taste. So, is the res the reservoir for the best umami? That's the ocean. We already talked about seaweeds. But of course, the fish and the shellfish. Um, uh, I've I've been quite fascinated with cephalopods uh, recently, uh, a species that we we have it in our waters here. We don't eat it, and we, you can make very delicious things out of cephalopods where you only need very small amounts, almost like you have butaga, and mm -hmm. and and then you can enhance a, a green meal. So yeah. insightful use of those species which by the way is on the rise. The populations are on the rise in contrast to the fish populations. So we should also look at that direction. Absolutely. Let me give you an example from my country. We have, we fish a lot of small fish, which people in, in Southern Europe, they would love. We have a little fish that literally looks like a sardine, sardine on anchovy. And you know, we, we, we fish amounts corresponding to the feed um, um, more than the whole population of Denmark with the necessary proteins, and we don't eat them. We feed them to 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 other fish, or to 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 grow pork. 
Yes, absolutely. And there's, uh, I really love this idea of, of, of using just respectfully and sustainably certain animal species to, to enhance the, 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 the plant-based diets. Um, I also think about fats, right? We often tend to waste or think, oh, fat is not good. You know, it makes you fat, right? Or whatever. We, we have all these misconstructions around, around fat and a tiny bit of fat with, with, uh, with vegetables will give the aroma, right? Because that's where the aroma of the, of the animal, let's say, um, uh, identity of flavor is really not necessarily only in the flesh, but actually in the fat. Right. Um, so, so seasoning there and having all these condiments um, that come from the ocean, I really feel um, is, is a key, right? And, uh, and we have, we have so, several questions here on the chat and I would like to, um, to, to, to defer some of them to you. First of all, um, someone asked, um, uh, Jesenia from Mexico asked, uh, she's a food educator and she, she wonders if, uh, your books are ever going to come out in Spanish. <laughs> uh, I hope so. If, 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 um, the good person who write would know of a publisher and, uh, been someone to, to, to translate it. I, I only have one book out in, in Spanish. And, and that is, um, that's on biophysics. Uh, that's actually on fats. It's a whole book oh. about fats. And it's called Life as a Matter of Fat. And uh, oh, so beautiful. that's sort of a membrane biophysics. Um, so um, I would love if someone would, would um, be interested in, in, in taking this to the Spanish speaking community. Yeah, uh, for sure. And, and, and the books, are, uh, my books are really written for, uh, written for an international audience. So, um, so there are examples from all over, all, all around the globe. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I do feel so. Just, just escucharon si quieren eh, si conocer a un pul alguien que publique, por favor, para poder traducir toda esta con toda esta sabiduría español. Uh, a little message out there: a bottle in the ocean to see if anyone comes up. Uh, and helps you translate that, this, this, this wisdom in, in Spanish. There's another question from um, uh, Miguel Sanchez. Um, how can we, so he, he asks about kids, about children who are often attracted to very sweet treats or flavors uh, and ingredients. Um, what do you suggest to make them uh, be more attracted to the vegetables and the proteins? I think it, it ties into what you were talking about earlier, yeah. but specifically about for children, what, what would be your strategy? Yeah, I'm happy to get that question because one of my main occupations at the moment is I'm running a, a national, large national Danish center for taste, where we actually work with taste education for children um, in all age brackets, developing teaching material for their schools and also doing chef schools, uh, festivals with the kids. And, um, the question here is, is, is a difficult one, but because it has to do with much more than taste or the senses themselves, but it also has to do with context. And I think many, many parents who have children, or small kids, might have heard that the children, when they are with another family or in the school, they happily eat something um, that uh, they would certainly not eat at home. And, um, and so this has to do with the social, the social context. So we have to make sure that we sort of separate that. And also, also another thing with children, there is, a, there is a phase of neophobia, which is a natural phase for, for a child who grows up that has a certain, from maybe year three and, and some years up, it can be many years for some people, they, they are for natural reasons, because that's basically by, again, by evolution, that is at the time where the kid would sort of move a little bit away from the parents and being an omnivore, you have to be careful. So it's, an, it's a fundamental thing with children to sort of not eat things they're not used to having. But um, the, the way we work with it in this center is that we try to um, help the children to get ownership to their own senses. And that is, we never, we never push them to do anything. I mean, they should maybe play with the, play with the food, uh, to learn about the food, ask questions about the food. And you can do various activities using food as sort of a material, something you play with. And, you know, eventually something will end up in the mouth. And I, I've been very inspired by this. There's a, there's a, there's a Dutch woman, an eating designer, um, 
um, Maria Fogelsang, and um, she has this wonderful play with children she called uh, um, uh, Betty, uh, Betty Bling Bling or something like that. And where the, 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 the play is that you just get whatever vegetables you had and put on the table and tell the kids, now you have, we, we making jewelry. This is not an exercise about eating or tasting, but we're making jewelry and you can make rings and you can make uh, bracelets and you can make all sorts of things you can put on your body, but you don't have any knives and you don't have any scissors. You have to use your teeth to sort of shape the material. And you can imagine what's going to happen. Another example from our center, we That's have a brilliant. woman who working with fish and uh, in this country, a lot of kids are really don't, they say they don't like fish and, and they think it doesn't taste, taste good, even if they haven't tasted it. And of course, in some cases, it's due to the fact that the fish, as you know, the fish is not fresh and has an odor and that's a different thing. But this woman, like is her name, she, she, she makes print with the children with fish. It's an, an ancient Japanese art called gyotaku where you basically have, you color your fish with some ink from, it could be sepia ink from, from a squid. And then you put a piece of, of absorbing um, uh, paper on top and then you get a wonderful print and you can bring it home and show it to your parents. And of course the idea is that you sort of you touch the fish and you look at the fish and eventually, you know, you can prepare something with the fish. And this is, this is most often what is happening. I mean, some of the people I've been working with, they can get children to eat raw oysters when they heard a story about oysters and people ate it in the Stone Age in this country. And they sort of open the oysters and find they're not smelly or anything. Uh, so it's, it's a matter, we, we call, it, uh, call it getting sort of own ownership to your world, learning about the world by your senses. Beautiful. And uh, the number of tricks you, you, you can do. The most important thing is that that uh, when it comes to cooking, um, it's very important that, that the parents don't sort of uh, control the kitchen. Uh, mm. The children have to be able to do whatever they want to do in the, in the kitchen in order to develop responsibility. And the parents have to trust them. Obviously, there'll be an issue with knife for very small children, but usually that's not, that's, that's not a problem. And um, the parents would have to make the investment that there is a bit of a mess uh, the first time uh, or sometimes, but, but that's a very good investment. And the, the most wonderful thing is then that the children, they learn something and then they say to, to the family, please, could we make this dish next Saturday and I'll, I'll take care of it or, or help doing that. And, and we, 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 we work along these lines by making providing for the ownership that maybe some classes work with chefs and scientists and educators and and they sort of gain this knowledge about food and cooking and then now they know and they tell others about it so they now make a class for their peers in another mm -hmm. class in school or go to a festival and put out a little booth and describe and ask people to come in and 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 use their senses. And the, this bridge building is, yeah, in yeah. my mind, the most powerful way of removing all these things with children being picky or don't want to yeah. eat things. It's beautiful also that you mentioned, um, like these examples, these strategies really are rooted in play, in appropriation and knowledge and, 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 and this kind of experimentation with the senses or sensorial exploration. Um, and with art, right? With, 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 the, with leveraging the beauty and you mentioned theater, you mentioned, um, right? It's, it's, really, it's really beautiful and it can be pleasurable. It, you know, I, and also that we, we've talked a lot about uh, a few years ago, I remember when, when we first or second time we met in London, uh, we discussed how gastrophysics uh, could be such a, a wonderful idea to have at schools every day you have an hour of gastrophysics around lunchtime or just before lunchtime uh, where you learn about the physics, the chemistry, the mathematics, the history, the, the anthropology of, of, of food, the agriculture of food, biology, everything you can learn yeah. through food and exactly. play. Um, and that is truly, truly, I think, uh, a, a dream at least that I have 
Um, and I'm not, I'm not the only one to, to really in the coming decades try to see more and more of this education um, in schools. Um, what what yeah, we've I, done in Danish schools is that we develop teaching materials for the teachers in all school disciplines, whether it be languages, history, geography, obviously domestic science, physics, chemistry, biology, using taste as a driver. Mm -hmm. and, and as you say, you can, since it's a matter of the, the senses, you're using the senses anyway when you learn about the world. So we claim and hope and we think we demonstrate you can, you can learn math by starting talking about taste. And it's not that difficult as it sounds. And I, I, I've seen that in the school system, there's actually, a, 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 there's a need for some renewal within the traditional curriculum. Uh, and so for instance, if, if some find that math is tedious and boring, actually, instead of taking a starting point in food, and in this case, quantifying or measuring food, you can learn math in a much more fun way. Yes, absolutely. Um, and so I have another question here, a bit more technical. We go back to the to the food techniques. Um, maybe last question. Um, we have, um, let me see where it is. So Kia asks, I'm um, wondering if you'd be able to discuss how umami plays a role in the Maillard reaction. Um, and, uh, you know, what, what's, the, what's the relationship between umami and the Maillard reaction, which for those of you who don't, who don't know in the audience, Maillard reaction is what happens when, um, Professor, correct me if I'm wrong, but when, when proteins are heated and there's a, a part of a caramelization happening that creates um, a more kind of balanced taste and, and a lot of aromas um, through the heat applied to, to flesh in particular, but not only it happens with meats, but also with, with vegetables. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, you're right that uh, Maillard reaction, which I think is the most wonderful thing in cooking. <laughs> and without that, we wouldn't have um, a nice brown crust on, on, on bread or, or on a roast or a dark beer or soy sauce and black garlic. And it's a, it's a chemical reaction between certain parts of proteins, amino acids, and, and certain, certain sugars and, and carbohydrates. Th there's really no direct relationship with that and, and umami. Uh, and um, although I, I, I suspect that the fact that during the uh, Maillard reaction, you form a lot of volatiles that is very pleasant. We find very pleasant, nutty, um, nutty aromas, um, chocolatey, all sorts of, 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 of pleasant um, flavors that they can maybe enhance umami. But there's no, I don't see any signs behind that. Uh, in fact, there are very little understood with respect to how odors uh, or olfactory sensation technically influences the other senses but and a lot of it I think goes through expectations and previous experiences. I, I'll just give you an example something we simply just don't know. We've been studying a whole range of different seaweeds from all over the world trying to identify some that has good umami potential um, uh, as, as you find in, in the Japanese kondu and we only find found a few that can has something similar to the Japanese, there's a particular red one called dulse, which is a very delectable red seaweed. But apart from that, it's mostly the Japanese kombus. But what we discovered was that when we exposed a, 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 a panel of tasters to these different kind of, it, in fact, it was extracts we made of the seaweed, uh, basically the dashis, there's no simple correlation between the, the content of glutamate and the perception, or at least for the sensory panel what they describe as umami and um, umami mm. intensity. And we have no idea why this is so, uh, but it's a matter of fact. And I think it's something that um, we would have to learn about because quite often, as we know, the aromas are extremely important for, 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 for a taste experience. And if we sort of work to make more umami, but it may not be that the taster can actually identify it and there may other other things that be the more important it is uh, complex certainly from the point of view of the technical point of view that is suppose you want to make a product
Okay, yep. I see and hear you again. Yeah, we lost you for a few seconds, I yeah. think. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's going around the globe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, at the speed of light, almost. <laughs> so I don't know if you, you heard it, but I, I don't have an explanation how the olfactory mm -hmm. sensation, sort of on a molecular level, how it interacts, but we know there is an interaction. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, interesting. So. So to answer Kia's question, it is probably most mostly about aromas eventually creating some kind of more complex and more uh, pleasurable sensation as a whole, right? And there's this 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 idea of a you know we feel perception as as one thing, right? There's a unity in perception that combines everything, right? So it's all these elements collaborating to create deliciousness. It could well be that the brain sort of brings together information about you having something. I, I'm, I'm thinking about a rose. This thing is a rose, a steak, which have a Maillard compound because of the crust. And that steak also had proper umami. And then you're, you're used to bring those two things together. And so if you have a cue of one, it may sort of stimulate the other. Mm -hmm. I'm just dreaming this up, but we, there are many cases, as you, as you also know, Charles, from your work in, in Oxford, that this multimodal system is, is, is very intricate, and there are a lot of things we don't know about it, mm -hmm. but we know for sure that the brain is sort of integrating all these things in some kind of experience that has many components, mm -hmm. and, uh, and certainly memory, as we know, is one of the more strong ones. Absolutely. It's just a tiny snippet of, of some uh, taste or aroma will bring us on a, on, a, on a time travel back in time. Yes, uh, the, the, the Proust phenomenon. Yeah. Oh, yes. I, could, I, could, <laughs> I could hear you speaking for hours, Professor, or sorry, you, you mentioned, you, you know, I don't need to tell you, Professor, it's just they have such high regard for, for your work and, um, and your books and, uh, and all the knowledge that you bring. I feel it's so um, timely that we pay more attention to education for adults, for kids, and I would say for policymakers to try and put food more at the center of the agendas. And I think it's happening, right? We have the United Nations next year uh, doing the Food System Summit, right? For the first time, there is a Food System Summit. And I think part of it is going to be innovation. Part of it is going to be new businesses, new products. Um, and, and I think this taste science um, can have two main kind of you know, um, accelerate, can, can serve to accelerate um, uh, a transition, mostly on one, on one end by education and on the other hand, by um, creating better products and experiences, whether it is at the restaurant, uh, at school, um, for supermarkets. Um, and of course, we, we need to be aware of this. So everyone watching this, um, it's an invitation to um, to talk about umami, to, to do more research around the synergies between different ingredients. Look up at your traditional dishes. Your grandma's dishes uh, would probably have these, these synergies. And, and this is something that we've learned for generations and generations. So let's look back. Let's remember this fermentation, these ancient processes, bring them to today uh, and use them to, to be more mindful and more, let's say, intelligent at how we consume the beautiful nature that we have around us, um, both in plant world and the animal world. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Ole, <laughs> Ole uh, how, how you pronounce it. Um, thank you so much for, for your time, for being so kind at, um, and generous with us. Um, and uh, I look forward to discussing more with you. And eventually, if you have any, any interesting um, write up um, uh, and collaboration, I would love to to eventually uh, uh, work with you and think about different ideas in writing as well. And um, because uh, it is such a, an important time to, to be thinking about all this.
Okay, thank you very much for having me. And I, I could just uh, maybe add one announcement because we, this year we were supposed to have, run a conference called Creative Taste Buds in the mm. spring. And, and because, of, because of the corona, it has been moved on to next year. So May, next year, May 3 and 4th, and it'll probably be on the web. But those who are interested in how, to, how we can save the world by taste, uh, look <laughs> up Creative Taste Buds. And uh, maybe there's something interesting that will come there in, in, in in the spring next year. Oh, I would Thank love to, to learn more about it too. To you. Thank you so much, um, Ole, and uh, have a great evening and great week ahead.